Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm having a discussion with Dr. Dwight Newman. He's a professor of law. Uh, sir, uh, obviously, uh, just maybe take us through a potential natural resources extraction, the, the, the project that wants to go ahead, a mining project or an oil and gas project, uh, and walk us through some of the hoops that they have to jump through on duty to consult and how this Supreme Court of Canada decision makes it a bit more complicated. Um, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I would think maybe more in terms of something like a pipeline project as sure. uh, really giving the hoops. Um, and essentially, uh, a company that's seeking to develop a pipeline project, um, they're uh, usually considering a route that's going to cross the traditional territories of many different Indigenous uh, communities. Um, and uh, you now add to those communities some that may be located outside of Canada. Um, but essentially, uh, they prepare, uh, well, they ideally engage early with the communities and now may need to engage with some communities located outside Canada as well. Um, and then they enter into the regulatory process around this. Um, and at the time of the making of a decision, uh, the, uh, the government uh, needs to take account of the duty to consult and needs to be carrying out consultation somehow through the process or to carry that out outside of that process. And those who would now be consulted could extend to include groups located entirely outside Canada. So you've just expanded those challenges a little bit, even potentially on a, a shorter uh, project uh, that, uh, that might have seemed like it involved only a limited number of uh, communities. Uh, well, it could now include communities across the border in the United States. The same would be true of an oil and gas project or mining project. There just often are a smaller number of communities involved, but now there could be more even there. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical, but what happens if there's a Canadian Indigenous group that wants that development, but there's a foreign Indigenous group that objects to that development? How, how, how do we deal with that situation? Right. So in a situation where that, uh, that Indigenous community located outside of Canada were to hold rights in Canada or potentially hold rights, they would need to be consulted. Um, and in the context of the consultation process, if they raised rights issues uh, that actually led to a modification of the project, it could be such that the project would be cancelled, even though a Canadian community wanted it to go ahead. The duty to consult as it uh, has developed, isn't actually about whether communities agree with projects or not so much. Right. Um, obviously, a community that agrees might not raise all of its concerns with the project or might negotiate about those in the context of an impact benefit agreement, something along those lines. Uh, but it's about whether there are rights held that should lead to a modification of the project. As we move towards um, more instances in which uh, governments are talking about free prior and informed consent, well, agreement um, starts to come into things even more so. And if there's a community that disagrees on a lot of views, uh, that would lead to a, a challenge for the, the project. And that could be a group located entirely outside of Canada, while a group in Canada does want it to go ahead. And that would be a, a pretty awkward situation from a Canadian standpoint, uh, but it's one that uh, that is opened up as a possibility by this uh, judgment. Uh, this is uh, just a question that popped into my head, but uh, are you the only person that's, that's, uh, that uh, has reported on this or has, uh, has examined this Supreme Court decision? It seems like it's a kind of a blockbuster uh, decision in terms of its implications. And uh, has there been a lot of commentary about this? I think we're starting to see more commentary now. And uh, that may be partly the pandemic slowed things down a little bit compared to sometimes. Uh, so I'm certainly not the only one who's commented on it. Um, it's on lists of uh, law firms, uh, uh, top Indigenous rights decisions right. of 2021, uh, some of which are circulating around now. And there was a panel at the Indigenous Bar Association about the uh, decision. Um, uh, the, the conference uh, last fall, and uh, part of the orientation of the panel was towards how to use this to litigate more cases. Um, so there are people already thinking about how to use this in litigation, um, but in terms of thinking about the, uh, all of the long-term implications of it, I think it's received less attention than is warranted, uh, given the, the degree that those, uh, to which those implications could rise. Was this a unanimous decision by the court? 
Uh, no, it wasn't a, a unanimous decision. Um, so Justice Cote is in a, a, a fuller dissent from the decision of the court. And then there's a, another opinion that's sort of in between and a little tougher to, uh, to decipher. Um, so there is a split there. And uh, Justice Cote's opinion in dissent uh, would have directed more attention to how she read the text right. and some of the history around how Section 35 was negotiated. Mm -hmm.